Hi, everyone. You're now officially locked into the session. Please don't let anyone out. <laughs> no, it's fine. You can leave if you want, but um, I, I can see your faces. <laughs> um, before I say anything important um, or interesting, I'm actually going to ask you a few questions. So who, who here actually considers themselves to be like a sound person or an audio person? That is actually a lot of hands. That's really cool. Who came into this room um, just because I yelled at you five minutes ago? One per Aaron, you make sound as well. That's fine. Okay, it's, it's all right to be shy with that kind of question. It's, okay. it's all right. Um, and then just like regular game developers or people that have, you know, other skills that are like higher up on their skill level than sound. Susan, yeah, I know. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, very good. All of you, you're very brave and you're very wonderful. Um, I have too many slides and too much content than I will actually get through today. So I'm going to blow through a lot of this stuff. I'm also going to, I'm going to try and show you some examples, but I'm probably going to have to cut down a lot of the contextualization of those examples just to play you some zombie sounds because it's more fun that way. Um, I'm also planning on turning this deck into a like YouTube presentation thing where I just talk by myself in a room. Um, so you can always just follow me on Twitter so that you can be alerted of that information being shared on the internet. Cool. So if you don't already know who I am, um, and sorry if you don't understand the reference to Hamilton, I live in the America now, so it's really big there. So um, I do audio for virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, creative. Um, it's a really creative and technical field. I'm a woman that works in that field. I say that's really, please turn that off. <laughs> I say that all the time because I think it's really obvious and it's really important for me to, to identify as the person that I am and to be really vocal about that so I inspire other people to do the same. And um, I am a little bit crazy and that's, that's totally fine. I'm an advocate for not only the superb usage and exploitation of spatial audio in VR, AR, MR and games applications of all kind but also for women, girls and non-binary folk working and engaging with audio, VR, and, and game development. I say that at every single conference I go to because I believe in it, um, regardless of whether I'm sitting with cool game developers or um, people that do sound engineering, which was where I was in New York just recently. I'm also the creative director of a company called OSIC. My specialization is in spatial audio there, um, of course. I have, um, I've spent a lot of money on my education, um, and I like to think that that's really important too. So I have a Bachelor of uh, Music Technology with honors and I have a Master of Design Science in Audio and Acoustics. I also think that audio is the future, so let's just get on to talking about that. I love talking about myself, so this slide will last for 50 minutes if I don't shut myself up right now. So, that's the title of the other presentation that I gave, that's fine. So, we've got, I, I already said this, but we've got so much to cover today, so forgive me if I talk really quickly, and if I'm vaguely intelligible at times, it happens, I would re recommend jumping on Twitter. So what I'm actually going to do is um, cover the science and history of 3D audio and VR audio, why I think that this medium that I work in now is so different, so special compared to previous mediums, and also, I'm not going to explicitly talk about this, but also why it's really relevant to just games in general. Um, and then I'm going to give you a bucket load of design considerations and also discuss the tech a little bit too at the end, but that will be the bit that ends up being in three minutes. So, first of all, um, it's one thing that we ask a lot within like the audio field is like, is this problem solved yet? Do we have perfect spatialization? Do we have perfect 3D audio? And the answer is no, which is why it's up on that slide right there. So, um, and this, this kind of thing is something that should be on like one of those funny websites that you check every day to see if Brexit has happened or not. Um, but yeah, we haven't quite solved this issue yet and I'll cover the, why that is in, in detail in the next like 10 to 15 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to cover it in detail regardless of whether you give a shit about psychoacoustics or not because I want you to understand how complex this is and how, how much development we have to do and how important all of you in this room are to actually helping that happen. So why do I think that the problem is not solved? Because the experiment is still going. Let me explain. The 3D audio industry is the largest real world psychoacoustics experiment that has ever been conducted. Everyone in the experiment uses the technology, but all of the, not all of the technology is as, uh, is as effective as it could be. Creating with the technology is deceptively easy and entrenched with traditional practices that are largely irrele irrelevant. And this industry and this experiment needs its own set of practices. And that's why I'm here today. So again, I'll stop rambling. We'll start with the science bit. So here's a picture of some little girls. <laughs> so elements of the core technology have been around since the early 1900s when John Strutt introduced the duplex theory. 
Some sources say that um, it was in 1907, which is why I have this really cute picture here. Effectively, academic researchers iterated on the challenges within psychoacoustics and 3D audio for over 100 years now. So bringing the technology to a place where it's actually serviceable within a co commercial industry like games 10, 15 years ago or VR now. So in some ways, both the best and the worst thing to happen to mammals in general is that we evolved to have two ears. Obviously, having two ears means that we can localize sound. Very useful for avoiding bear attacks, but it didn't really help Leo in that movie, did it? So that's really sad. <laughs> However, the complexity of the physical listening system and how much it varies, not only between various animals, like all those cute things up there. Why does it auto advance? I hate it when it does that. <laughs> yeah, anyway, the, everyone's ears are very, very different. If you look around at everyone's ears in the room, you'll see that they all just like, no one's ears are gonna be exactly the same. But unfortunately, the technology kind of just assumes that everyone is, has an ear that's similar enough to an average and kind of gives you that. So remember how I said the technology is not as effective as it could be? It's largely true because the key problems caused by the human listening system, so your ears and brain and stuff like that, haven't been solved yet. Mostly because our ears are just so hecking unique. Like, look at these ears. Look at all these ears. There's some baby ears. There's like some old people ears and there's a lot of like different ears from different people's races and everyone, it's very systemic, there's lots of very, like systematic, there's lots of variables that are included in these different ear shapes. It's all really cool. I think it's really interesting. So this actually means that as creative practitioners, you need to understand more about the human listening system and the science behind psychoacoustics in order to design audio for VR, AR, MR, and even games if you want to make really good audio for your games as well. So this is um, so this is so that you can understand what additional creative decisions you need to make because of the new paradigm you're working in and also to help understand the limitations of the technology as well. How it impacts your work and how you need to communicate with your clients or just game developers that exist in the world. So let's get stuck into the even more technical bit because that wasn't technical enough. So, as I said, there's a huge history of research that's gone into understanding all of this. We won't go through all of it because I haven't done enough PhDs just yet, <laughs> or any of them. But the three main components are the duplex theory, as I just explained before, of the interaural time difference and the interaural level difference. I'll explain what it is, it's fine. Monaural listening cues, and then also the fact that like this, this guy, Hats, oh, his name is Hats. You have a torso and that gives reflection cues from your shoulders as well. That Hats stands for head and torso simulator, by the way, just in case you didn't know that. Uh, the duplex theory, which was the first one that I just said, um, includes the internal time difference and internal level difference, as I just said as well. So ITD and ILD is what we call them. So these were some of the first theories about how humans localize sound. Simply stated, the fact that you have a head, which is a solid object for most people, impacts on the time that it takes <laughs> for a sound to reach both ears, as well as the level that it is when it reaches either ear as well. So this different changes as the angle and the elevation of the sound changes. But wait! Researchers quickly decided there must be something more than the duplex theory because there's actually many locations where the time difference and the level difference are exactly the same. It's called a kind of a confusion because like that diagram that I literally ripped off the yeah, University of Miami, Miami website, um, it's shaped like a cone. That makes people sad. It should make people sad. There you go, big sad face instead of big happy face. So, monaural listening cues describe the cues that you get from using just one ear. That's that's kind of like mono sound, mon oral. Yeah, you got it. Where well, the shape of your ear causes micro delays and cancellations depending on where the sound came from. When that angle changes, it changes the way the source sound interacts with your ear because it catches different folds and cavities around the ear. These cancellations create, uh, is there anything that goes up there? Cool, good. These cancellations create interesting look, the interesting looking patterns that you see in head related transfer function graphs. Those aren't head related transfer function graphs, but they still look interesting. <laughs> um, this is probably the hardest part of the puzzle of human -like localization, and this is what leads me to say that we haven't solved the problem yet. Something you might think that should be simpler to characterize since everyone has an ear, can't you just measure everyone's ears and work it out with a computer or something? Um, but each fold in the ear is actually an independent variable that can impact on other variables or other folds, like the sound that comes from those folds as well, um, in, in that system of your ear. So each of these variables is impacted by the nature and direction of the source material as well. So that's why it's so hard. Uh, <laughs> I love talking about how hard it is because everyone looks really concerned. So talking about torso and shoulder reflections a little bit. So the, the shoulder and torso, let's just combine both those words together in different combinations. 
gives reflection cues as well, so sound will bounce off your shoulders, and that contributes to our HRTFs or head-related transfer functions in a way that mostly kind of re relates to elevation, but gets more interesting and complex when you consider that you can tilt your head around in interesting directions as well. So the type of clothing that you wear can impact on the amount of reflection that you get from your shoulders, but there's actually a lot of research, or some research, that can test the importance of shoulder reflections entirely, particularly be below three kilohertz and even above three kilohertz as well, as the pin are mostly masks a lot of that reflection stuff. There's a reference up on the, on, um, there's two references up on the, the slide there. You can go read those books if you want. So if you were thinking that was complex enough, uh, it's even more complex than that. Are you going to... No? Okay, that's better. So really, there's a bunch of other elements that your brain uses to tell where sounds are coming from, like head angle, head micro movements, room reflections, interall, envelope difference, motion parallax, proximity effect, and interall phase difference. You guessed that I'm not going to tell you all about them. Um, there's like actually those huge number of factors. They fit into two vague categories. I call them either bodily factors or external factors. So bodily factors are like the the, to the torso and shoulder reflection, your spectral cues, your head angle the IPD, IED, head micro movements, anything to do with your body, I call that bodily factors. Can you guess why? And then your external, your external factors, like the listening system or whether you're using headphones or speakers, those sorts of things, acoustics, motion parallax, room reflection, source coloration, those sorts of things. So to do with the body, outside of the body, you have to think about both of them. It, that makes it hard, of course. So let's just say that the difference in your ear shape can cause a significant array of difference in the resulting encoded sound, or HRTF. Those are actually HRTFs. That, of what you hear. And this individual encoding isn't interchangeable. That's why they're all so different on this page. So these are some of my old classmates from the University of Sydney. I won't go into detail talking about the, the like um, peaks and dips and everything in there because that takes time and I'm going to run out of time anyways. But you can see how different they are. Um, and everyone that actually like we, we experimented with and we did listening tests with was actually able to localise with their own ears to some extent. So that's good news for them. But if we were to swap those ears, like those, these HRTFs around with people, that, that ability would be hugely degraded. So you can't really swap around ears. You can't really generalise it either. This is like um, I took my 30 classmates and we kind of averaged everything out. And that's what it looks like. That actually looks nice and clean, but it's not going to work for everyone. You, you remember all those weird shapes that we saw before on the last slide. like. It's, it's not really fair. People won't be able to hear where, where the zombies are coming from. Nobody wants that. So, in a weird way, it's kind of why academia needs VR and games and why VR and games needs academia as well. Let me explain. Arguably, we really haven't needed this technology outside of ac the academic landscape for all types of media, like whether it's listening to music, surround sound, mixing in a studio, playing most games or some games even. But now we do with this, this kind of like VR stuff that's going on. I don't know if it's going to stick. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but we've had so many new mediums come and go. So why should we change our approach and learn all this new stuff just because of VR? That's meant to be like a 3D TV thing. But I liked it because the zombies are reaching out of the television. So VR is actually the perfect medium for sound. And anything 3D is actually the perfect medium for sound. So the reason why that is because the inherent flaws of the first gen technology. And this is what you talk about when you have to talk to your client about why you need to spend all this time doing cool R&D and trying all the spatializers. It's because, like, as humans, we only have a field of vision of about 100 degrees laterally from each eye outwards. And that includes a max, uh, like 30, 35 degree maximum eye tilt and then 60 degree maximum head tilt rotation and the, the peripheral head tilt of 100 degrees. So all those bits kind of equal 100 degrees. But many of the headsets that we use today only have a field of vision of about 110 degrees total. So some are more, some are less as listed up there, which is a really limited window into the world of the VR experience that you're making. We would all very easily agree that audio is the easiest way to fill the rest of that space since people here in 360 anyway. Um, and the brain actually processes audio sound faster than visuals as well. So to me, like all these reasons are just really easy wins that um, if you're a sound person, you can kind of say like, hey, we should definitely think about putting a lot more time and effort into early stages of sound design so that we can actually create something that makes more sense to our end user's brain and helps fill in all those gaps. So we also factor into, factor into this that the current generation of VR and AR technologies has fairly rudimentary player input devices like these things up here. Simple controllers with buttons, pads, and joysticks. It's without question that these are fantastic and they work really well right now, but abstracting your natural hand movement to these sorts of devices is not entirely natural. Click, click, button. There's too many buttons on those things. Like, they, they freak the shit out of me. 
And I don't think that even gloves are very reliable all the time just yet. So here's another way that we can really enforce the player's desire to interact with that world, that really, really cool world that you're creating, and actually really help them do that well. So the issues with the current player input standards are amplified by the fact that we, as an industry, just don't have that much experience with the platform that we've created now. So complete sensory substitution hasn't been done in consumer products at this scale previously, meaning that we are still looking for the perfect end user experience, which is why it's really important that everyone keeps experimenting and just trying shit. So we'll discuss for the next section is how audio can be used to provide some of that more complex user experience. So giving players agency and volition within in interactive experiences in general. So I have a simple formula for how to achieve this effectively. You as a content creator need to understand the technology. You need to prepare the best content possible. And then you also need to understand the perception of the end user to, and give them a perception, like a, a result that's cohesive and unbroken. All this together equals the end experience. Nothing less. There are no shortcuts. So you have to do this stuff that I'm telling you. <laughs> and I like to segment my approach into design and implementation in new realities into two critical elements. So consideration in spatial and immersive design covering sound size, sound staging, and acoustical considerations and human limitations as well, covering human attention characteristics and the drawbacks of overstimulation as well. So we'll touch on sound size first. It's a really simple concept that we all know really well. Big things make big sounds and small things make much quieter sounds. Traditional media allows us to treat these sound sources by modifying the volume of the source itself. This has been adequate for flat screens or 2D media with limited to no interaction as we're making sense of dif distance through a portal like through a window, right? Add in reverb and other distance creating effects and you can move the plane away so that's just about as quiet as the mouse. That was fun to do on that slide. <laughs> Yay! So how does this change in, three, in 3D experiences and in VR as well? In interactive experiences, it's highly likely that the player will have agency to move towards, away, around various sound sources, or have them move ar like around them as well. Of course, I just said that, duh. Volume alone cannot recreate the relationship between the player and these sources effectively. Volume needs to become only one part of the ID of the source, represented by two characteristics. Some of these sound people, like, you're going to know this, and that's fine. So the minimum distance, which is effectively the radius of the sound, that it is at 100% the entire time, and the maximum distance, which is the point at which the attenuation profile of the sound has taken full effect and the volume is effectively at 0%. These also can be extended into it by including concepts like envelopment and extent. However, these are a lot less common and less standardized terms and can differ quite a lot across different tools. So these types of effects will allow you to manipulate the perceived immersiveness of the sound by wrapping it around the player, these, this is a similar sort of thing to having a, like a volumetric sound source, which is something that's coming through in, in VR technology right now. So what sound size boiled, boils down to is the fact that we're trying to simulate an entire world with all the sound elements included. But is it a simple one-to-one -one simulation? Yes and no. You obviously need to, uh, to be deliberate with your sound design and implementation to help the player through the experience but you might also need to manipulate the design and move away from a pure simulation style of design to achieve this. For example, if the mouse is a narrative tool that alerts the player to a nasty monster jumping out of a dark crevice somewhere, I would manipulate the sound size characteristics of that mouse so that it was larger than it was meant to be, or at least sounded like it was larger, to catch the attention of the player earlier so that they can look around them, but like behind them, both to witness what's going to happen but also react to what's going to happen in a way that makes them feel like they're not completely sucking at your game. So we'll dive a little bit deeper into how to achieve this and complement this with traditional sound design effects as well. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You can still use the trusty sound design tactics to help curate the sound design for the player. So you can do things like really simple things like using EQ to make things brighter or darker to help them sink, stick out or sink back. You can even do this on an, on an individual event level. So sidechain EQ and volume trimming are not important sounds. Um, to suppress them is also, in, is also something that you can do. Manipulating your reverb, I'm behind. Manipulating your reverb sends to wrap this, to warp the sense of space of particular sounds because psychoacoustically more reverb equals probably a louder sound. Use of silence as well to draw attention to what happens after the silence. Again, we're also drawn to quiet as an indicator that something is about to happen. This also makes your dynamic, your dynamic range, oh my god, squeezing the words together again, work for you by creating the sense of space before the boom, for example. So please note, if you're applying these effects to sounds on the event level, 
you are applying these effects to both ears at the same time, which is going to dim diminish the effect of the binauralization because, freak, uh, because like as, as we saw in the HRTF charts, it's all frequency dependent. So good luck actually splitting out the left and right ear and doing the right thing there. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm going to really, really, really quickly show you something in FMOD. Really quickly because I'm already running out of time. <laughs> so what we've got here is a session from, um, a recreation of a session from when I worked at Zero Latency. Simplified, uh, we have a zombie voice here. One of the things that I wanted to do was, uh, when I was working there, was help people understand when there was a zombie behind them because we were working with OSVRs and they have a pretty limited field of vision. Oh, that's not even showing. That's great. Cool. Anyway, limited field of vision, wanted to make people turn around. So I tried a bunch of things, a lot of things, over a long period of time. And one thing that I actually found was sort of effective, or at least sounded like it was effective to me, um, <laughs> was actually manipulating the EQ of the sound when it was in different uh, like direction orientation from you. So I'll just show you here. I'll show you, where am I going to show you here? That, okay, I'm looking at the direction parameter here, which is an inbuilt parameter in FMOD. Um, what I actually do might seem like stupid and counterintuitive, counter but it actually sounded pretty ace, um, is that when the, when the zombie's in front of you, like, you've got a gun, you can see it, like, you can shoot it. You, you're pretty aware of the fact that it's yelling in your face and it's going to claw your brains out, that, that sort of stuff. And when it's behind you, like, with the gun and everything in your hands, like, you, you're less likely to be paying attention to what's going on behind you unless you can really, really hear it. So effectively, I bumped up the, the high end when the zombie's in the rear by using the direction parameter here. But I did that by cutting the high end when the zombie's in front of you. So yeah, they kind of sound a bit muffled. But yeah, you also don't notice because you've got a gun in front of you, which already has a lot of high end, some extent, like to some extent, some high end to it. And I'm really trying to make that the more scratchy, well, the more scratchy part of the frequency spectrum stand out when the zombie is behind you. Um, yeah, we can play this. Um, we want them to be angry. Apparently this is angry, okay. Anyway, you're not, re not really going to hear it. Okay, you can kind of hear it there. So it just sounds a little bit duller when it's actually in front of you and a little bit brighter when it's behind you. Little things like this, I kind of layered them through, through these major elements like the zombies. I mean, there wasn't really anything else happening in the game aside from shooting zombies. So little things like that. I found that they really helped. It's not something that people are going to be like, oh my god, when you change that thing in the game in that recent build, it made it so much better. But you can kind of watch how people are reacting and make little tweaks like that. Now we continue. Um, separate display, because you don't get to read my presenter notes. I do. OK, let's just get to the next slide. All right, we're going to talk about sound staging for a bit. So taking a step back from the individual sounds, we can have a look at how these sounds can be staged across the scene that the player perceives and within. So we usually use the term sound staging when we're talking about depth of a recording or production, how faithfully speakers or headphones reproduce that virtual stage. Essentially, it describes the phenomena of an imaginary stage like this that it has depth, width, um, and all sorts of spatial characteristics like that. Creatively, sound staging can refer to our ability to push and pull sounds through that stage by using EQ, comp compression, reverb, or other effects like that. We sort of already get this a bit for free in 3D games, which is why games is awesome. But there can be a lot of natural space between sounds if sound sources are spaced throughout, throughout the world, and basic 3D panning attenuation um, if you are used as a result. However, I posit that the change in perspective from the screen to the headset um, and the tech that we use actually means that we have to put more attention and care into how we design our virtual worlds. Don't touch that. Particularly in how our words are staged from the player's perspective and how the player relates to them as well. This builds off the idea that sound size design and manipulation that we just discussed by saying, you're going to do this with one thing and then you're going to put it there and then you're going to listen to it as you move around it. Sounds great. Or it should, when you, if you do it right. So let's get the boring slide out of the way first. So changing your perspective on this and actually designing your virtual sound stage is super important. So, so important that it actually helps the player in several, several ways. So it ensures non-critical sounds and non-attention grabbing because that would annoy the hell out of me in a zombie game if I was like paying attention to some silly thing off on the side and then I died. That happened all, all the time. So it also ensures that non-visually re represented sounds are non-attention grabbing because people notice really dumb shit in VR. Let's just say that. It also helps understand the player, um, helps the player understand what is happening around them and what might happen to them as well. And it gives the player more control and power. I call it agency and volition, just like everyone else in VR, because we love buzzwords. 
And that helps the player understand their relationship with the world, which helps them understand scale, distance, and their role within the story, which are things that you try and design as a game designer, but without using all the creative tools that you have in your toolbox, you're going to fail at doing that in a very convincing way. Yeah, that. Okay. It's an, unfortunately a really short video, but I can talk uh, around the few things um, that I'm going to show in this video before I jump in there because I got told off for talking during the video that I wanted people to listen to last time. <laughs> so um, we've got some really sparse sound design at the start that, that allows the players to have a bit of a wow moment before they jump into it. Um, we build the music over time and that helps shape the build in energy over the course of the game as well. Um, there's lots of different types of animals, but you can try and spot them if you want. You can try. Um, the rotate, like the sky and sea planes also rotate as well. You'll, this will all make sense when you actually see it. Um, it's not too obvious that you would hear it over videos, but you can see it happening in the in the videos. Um, it's specifically timed movements cues as well. So they actually start before and end after um, the players actually move, so that it kind of tips them off that they might actually start moving, but they don't move themselves anyway. It's a zero latency video. That's why they don't move, but they move. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. We're in a hurry. 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 Now we get it. <laughs> All right. Enjoy. I guess. Play. Play the movie. Play the movie. Play it louder. Oh, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. That was a peacock just there. Did you do any peacocks, Susan? You did bird. That's not a peacock. No. That's the ocean, by the way, in case you didn't know. Where the video ends. Um, <laughs> again, um, the clips are really short, so it's kind of hard to hear um, what's actually going on, which is sad. It makes me sad inside my soul. But basically, like, um, oh, Susan, I'm going to make you sad. <laughs> so I hope you noticed some of the things that we highlighted before, or I've just suspended your disbelief so far that you're just going to believe me anyway. Anyway, uh, yeah, so what you won't see, I'm not even going to show you the upmod project because I kind of want to keep blowing through this. Um, so I approach sound staging with three distinct zones um, that help me categorize the importance of sounds and hence where they should be effectively placed within the world. So starting furthest away, I keep my environment sounds as far away as possible and they stay there because no one's going to interact with the ocean. Like, we don't let them jump in. That would really hurt them if they did. Um, and, okay, I'm not going to talk about the example, but, you know, in that video, the environment features some really pretty visual assets that would... Susan Trudeau. And there were some, like, there were some from, from frogs, whales, manta rays, and birds. But there was really only one of each of those assets made in the game. Is that right? Yes, just say yes. <laughs> so knowing that I would place many of these sound effects, uh, so knowing that, I, would, I placed many of these sound effects way off in the distance and added um, extra animals to push vibrancy. So things like pepper shrikes, nightingales, macaws, dolphins, orcas, whales, that funny little desert frog, um, prairie dogs, all sorts of things like that. They're not seen, they're not contextualized, but they're part of the world. Fortunately, no one went looking for a pepper shrike, so I win. <laughs> I also have a mid-distance zone uh, where I put any props that it might, uh, my, and it might actually include environment sounds as well. Um, they live in there. I don't want these sounds to be too interesting to players, though, be like it, because they're not meant to be interacted with or they're not meant to guide the player through the story, they're probably just going to be distracting time sync for the player and probably even frustrate the player if they can't interact um, with the interesting sound object. Good example of that, unless they fixed it, was in Arizona Sunshine, in that first area that you spawn into. You can walk up to a barbecue, but you can't, like it's making noise, but you can't actually play with the patties that are on it. Anyway. So as promised, I'm not, actually, I'm not, I can't promise that because I'm not going to show you. Um, yeah, and then we, we, I put movement and um, intimate sound effects in the closest zone to the player because these are the kind of things that really help give the player a sense of scale, size, space, and then also their agency and volition. So I'm just going to blow through that and talk about player interaction. 
really quickly. How are we doing for time? Terribly. Excellent. So <laughs> to continue down that yellow brick road, we can look at the player interactions as an important part, the most important element actually, that deserves a lot of attention from sound designing games and also game designing games as well. So one of the coolest things that can happen in VR and why I love it so much is that the player can actually interact with the world around them with their hands. This, is, um, this agency and volition that the players have is actually really important to support with our sound design work. So you're important now, but you already thought that. <laughs> so sound staging now includes how you treat sounds and interactions that occur within arm's reach of the player. Like this baby has an ice cream and they're very happy because they can play with it and it makes the right sounds. So if the player can interact with objects within arm's length, that arm's length zone is really important to prioritize for reasons that we discussed just before. Agency, volition, reward, you're on my page, it's fine. The good news is that there's plenty of things you can do to preserve this, preserve this range. So they, whenever I suggest things like this, I actually end up repeating myself over and over again, which is really good for you. But that also means I'm not gonna repeat myself over and over again. I'm just gonna make them pop up on the slide and then we can talk about it really quickly and that's it. So most, most your selected most important sounds, do a bit of a DB boost, low end boost, um, when they come very close to you, that's called the proximity effect. That actually happens in HRTFs as well. And there's even a separate set of HRTFs that should be modeled for um, within a meter too, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Conversely, your deprioritized sounds, you can cut the volume down or cut, um, cut the EQ on the high end or low end to push them further away too. So your classic side train compression as well, you can see I'm talking about exactly the same things. And you can do all the same across um, direction and orientation too of your sounds to highlight sounds that are in a particular zone, just like I did with that zombie. Now we're gonna talk about environment for a bit. Cool, so I wanna talk about environment, environmental characteristics because they're incredibly important in the way that we localize sound, of course, otherwise it wouldn't be important to have particular size roomed rooms in the world. And our effects that will have increasing importance as our technology pipelines mature in VR and in games in general as well. I'll only touch on them briefly and talk about them very quickly because there aren't actually many technology solutions that actually offer control of these variables. So this is kind of like a bit of a tease for you. Sorry, not sorry. So the big three that I think are important were on that slide just then and I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> so room characteristics refer to spe the specifically design of the room itself. It is, whether it's square, rectangular, circular, dodecahedron shape, which is a 20 sided thing that starts with P. Uh, more complex spaces will have more complex implications on the sounds, the way the sound sounds when, the, when it reaches the player. So throwing a rectangle on this room doesn't adequately model the nature of the room. You'll get improper height and distance cues depending on where you place that rectangle, resulting in a room that either sounds too big or too small for how it presents. Doing this might actually make the room acoustically easier to understand for the player, but as our tools mature, I would hope that listeners will start to experience the true nature of sound and the feeling of spaces like this. I bet we all still have those hee hee, that's cool moments when we walk through tunnels and find round spaces that sound really interesting. Why would we take that away from the listener? Particularly when architectural features like this are designed to be feature spaces in games. Do your environment designers and level designers a solid and actually do something to model spaces like this. They'll love you for it. So current tools, if they have room modeling at all, really only have the capacity to, ro to model regular rectangular rooms, but Steam Audio and Nvidia are exceptions to, to this, so I'm excited about where it's gonna go, of course. So the acoustical properties of the space I list separately from size and shape of the space because they're likely to be technologies that come in different waves or a bit later down the track. They certainly do have their own independent impacts on the sound that you listen to. I should have those notes up there by now. So sound absorption refers to the, measure, the measured amount of a particular surface material is able to absorb or reflect a sound. These are communicated as coefficients, which is basically just a multiplier that allow you to compare the absorption across different surfaces between zero and one, like in that chart that I saw from another website. These properties are frequency dependent in the real world as the material will have different impacts on different frequencies. Typically, depending on the material, these could, they could be less absorptive at low frequencies and more reflective at high frequencies, but that's not a rule of thumb. You guessed it, there aren't that many tools that actually model this stuff. Again, Steam Audio and Nvidia are ahead of the curve here, allowing you to manipulate some of the you know, absorption coefficients of the materials in your space is made of. However, the frequency dependent bit is still tricky. Um, yeah, so. We'll just skip next, 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 next. So I wanna talk a little bit of, about occlusion and obstruction as well, um, because there's something that does, this is something that actually does exist in our game engines already to some extent. So this is actually pulled off the Audio Kinetic website. So they have pages on this too. 
So sound very rarely travels unimpeded towards the listener, but the way that we make our games right now, we kind of pretend that that's the case unless we know what these two O words mean. So these concepts are actually really similar to some traditional acoustical concepts, which makes me really excited. Um, occlusion is a, essentially sound transmission by another name, and this value describes the amount of both direct and reflected sounds can be transmitted through various materials or objects in the game. Obstruction only applies to the direct path of the sound source, so what comes from my mouth and lands in your ears and not bouncing off the walls. This applies, this, this is because it assumes that the reflections will travel around the obstructing object and also that reflected sound pathways will be treated by the occlusion value that you design into your engine. Um, these features exist on an engine level within audio middleware like WISE and FMOD and CryEngine as well apparently because that came up in my Google search. NVIDIA's VR Audio X also handles these types of calculations as well. Good luck on actually getting time to do any of that in games. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a little video from Magic Leap because I think that this is kind of where it's going to become really important and super cool. I'm going to stop talking. This is the bit where you go, wow, that's really cool. What's this technology? He's holding a gun, but he's in an office. Wow, cool. Otherwise, like, what would we have to dream about in the future? So, so I'm going to talk about human limitations really super quickly. Um, I, people can get really easily distracted, um, me as well, apparently. <laughs> so, um, but you also have an amazing ability to focus. It can be extremely easy to break immersion by distracting the player. And by doing so, we actually cause a uh, decrease in cognitive performance within the game as well, or whatever you're making. So when it comes to distracting people, well, we already know that's easy because I did it to you just then. But cognitive science has a lot to say about how easy this is. I'm just going to load up all the notes on this and then you can read about it and then go and watch Aaron Brown's talk from Austin Game Conference because he also goes into this as well. Here you go, you can take a picture of this if you want. Basically, there's already perceptual psychophysics areas that already talk about this sort of stuff. Um, we can pick up on when something sticks out really, really quickly, like within 30 milliseconds. And that includes both spectral content and also volume differences as well. So if you can distract people that easily and actually make them pay attention to looping points or just bad footsteps and stuff like that, if you're not paying attention to those things and you're not really being very, very, very <laughs> deliberate about the types of content that you put in your games and especially VR games, you're just gonna, like you might end up with someone that's just going, oh wow. I heard a dog bark in that ambience, but this is meant to be the zombie apocalypse and there's no dogs, haha. -ha. And then 30 seconds later, oh, I heard that dog again, haha. -ha. And then they're not shooting zombies in the game. Very sad. Another interesting cognitive effect that I believe is really important in VR is the simple cocktail party effect. The cocktail party effect is the phenomenon of being able to focus one's auditory attention on a particular stimulus while fil filtering out a range of other stimuli. You've been practicing this all week. As, um, yeah, as you're doing this week, so, yeah. Suggestion, uh, selections can be made on subjectively important messages, so names, particular words and stuff. That's how you hear about when someone's talking, like, talking about a job that you want, <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm gonna follow that person now. Um, this can be incredi incredibly difficult to do in virtual auditory displays like VR and 3D audio in games, as there's a huge range of stimulus that's presented to the player and basically beamed directly into their ears, usually quite loudly. So you as a designer need to curate the world for the player and do some of this cocktail party affecting by creating situations where it's easy for the player to focus. However, people can't do this if the mix is too busy. Um, if there are too many sounds triggering at once, you'll completely destroy the, the player's ability to hear the important cues, react in time, and experience your work as well, which is totally the opposite of what you want. 
in any sort of virtual or 3D world. So the final fatal human condition in VR audio that I want to discuss with you is actually you. <laughs> You're not asleep at the wheel, but the inherent way that you have to do your job is the biggest downside to working in digital media in general. In development, you create a pathway of expectations through your experience, i.e. you become asleep at the wheel. And you get used to run forwards for 20 metres, turn left, run again, jump, kill the zombie. You, be, you develop a pattern of how you know exactly how to play that game. In 360, in VR, uh, 360 degree in VR environments, overstimulation and the te temptation of exploration is strong for non-expert players. And most people that are going to be playing your stuff are non-expert players. <laughs> so you have to expect this and preempt your design for this. You need other people to test your work and give you a sanity check. You must take advice from people who are not expert listeners like you because you are not your target market. It is more likely that it's going to be the common person that plays with crappy in-ears and not your $500 headphones. So take my, take my advice about that and actually get other people to listen to your stuff every now and then. If you can, that can be hard. But first of all, and something that I think someone should make one of those, oh no, that's got the wrong notes on it. Cool, whatever. Anyway, onto a lighter note, let's discuss how the state of the hardware we use impacts on our design decisions as well, but really quickly. So coming into interactive VR audio allows for a lot of creative power and space to play. However, the unique combination of high-tech processing and hardware is, um, that is still developing means that you might end up hitting like ceilings in your processing. So particularly in multiplayer games, um, in wave shooters as well, um, all the stuff that's going on. Yeah, user creation environments are going to be problematic for you too. And if the team is not in experienced with interactive content design, sorry. But games people are usually pretty savvy for this, so that's really good. I like games people for that reason. So what, what do you do about that? Well, this is the harder bit. Having an understanding of how your content will perform on a minimum spec VR ready machine is obviously very important, but also working with developers to be aware of what your processing percentage loads limits are is, is important as well. So this will become more and more of an issue as we start seeing more and more standalone headsets like the headset, like the Oculus Go and the Samsung thing that has a weird name or evolution or something like that. So debugging and profiling throughout development is super critical. So keeping tabs on the actual performance of your design is the best way to avoid hitting nasty ceilings and then having to trim it all back. So left is F1 Studio debug overlay, which is my friend, and right is the Unity's inbuilt profiler. I don't know how deep the features in that run, but yeah, debug early, debug often. Or maybe just don't spatialize everything. Heresy, but seriously, oh no, but seriously, you don't need to spatialize everything especially if you're going to run out of memory on a mobile VR title. So, um, yeah, I've got, more, I've got more slides on like tools and pipeline, but I'm also like really close to being out of time. So I just want to cover really quickly. Um, these are sort of theoretical. They don't go into a lot of detail, but comparing linear and interactive VR, like for 3D audio type of stuff, like you're making trade-offs with the technology at the moment, which is kind of sad, but also kind of cool, because it means that you can find ways to work around some of these challenges. So with linear, with linear inter environments, interactive environments, you're trading off the, the lack of ability to have real-time manipulation for a really essentially processing heavy pipeline at the moment. And for like actual benefits of like, comparing linear and interactive environments. If you're working in linear, linear, you get to use Pro Tools and you get to use Reaper and other things that are really, really well suited for, for developing and designing audio. Whereas in interactive, you get to do fun stuff like making volumetric and positional audio and having player agency and volition. And when it comes to spatial processing, you're making a trade-off between generalized and customized um, algorithms at the moment. So you're trading off localization accuracy generally for something that's more processing heavy. This, I remember this has a bad build-in, but I didn't fix it. <laughs> so this is kind of, this is not an accurate visualization of the pipeline entirely, but here you go. This is kind of like some of the tools, not all the tools that exist, but all lined up. So you're starting at the door where you're like doing your choppy choppy edit edit stuff that puts you to sleep. Um, mostly I put Reaper and Pro Tools there, but there's obviously other things that you can use. Um, middleware as well, so Wise and FMOD, obviously there's other things that you can use. There's a butt ton of spatializers, which is really, really fun. Not all of them you can use in interactive environments, but um, I spatialized the music for Engineerium that, that Aaron wrote um, before I actually put it into FMOD because there was just too much of it and there was no way that was all going to be spatialized real time. 
Um, and then I have the engines on the far right hand side. But then if we actually look at how that actually fits in our pipeline at the moment, I'm going to load it all up and then we can, we can talk about it in five seconds. So we've got the pipeline point at the top and the general major big technologies. And then at the bottom, we've got the specialization tools that you can, you can probably use because it changes every five seconds. So at the top, um, Reaper Pro tools representing like linear environments. And in those, you'll be using the Facebook uh, 360 spatial workstation, new audio technologies, G-Audio, Waves, Audio Ease, Envelop. Did I miss any? Stefan? Yeah, that's, that's fine. I'll get over it. Also, Oculus, Dolby Atmos, and Google have linear tools. If you're working in middleware, you'll be trying to use um, Real Space 3D. Only I get the OSIC planner at the moment. There's also a Dolby Atmos planner if you're really friendly with Dolby. Um, and then there's also Google and Oculus, which are really easy to get, which is cool. Um, and then you can use 2 gigs if you still have the libraries for that. Yeah. Um, and then on the far right hand side, if you're yeah right hand side, if you're just working in engine, you'll be using something like 3D Sound Labs, super powered D Dear VR or Steam Audio, which it sounds okay, I think. Yeah. All right. In the end, individuals who have highly developed skill sets in interactive audio design, like you wonderful games people, have the best background possible to participate, to participate in what I think the where I think the VR and VR and 3D content industry will go. It will in inevitably go interactive, so you c you're going to make bank if you actually you know, figure out this stuff and start doing it really well. Um, so your skills in dealing with the adaptive and dynamic audio combined with your psychoacoustics knowledge, is that loaded? No. And how, about, how do you know humans here? Your knowledge of the pipeline and what imp in <laughs> impacts the human and software and elements and all your fancy philosophies about immersive environments, sound staging, intimate space, your understanding that your own testing is biased, as well as your understanding of the limitations of technology and how you can help rem remedy that. There's more. Acoustics as well. No, okay, yeah. You'll be fine. Take the kitten. Anyway, I'll go back. I'll go back to where I started in the beginning and say that this is a dynamically evolving field that includes academic research and rapidly developing commercial industry as well. It's also the largest psychoacoustics experiment that has ever been conducted, and we're still, still trying to prototype the experiment while we're testing it on people. This field will grow and develop in ways that we both can and can't imagine. My money is on AR audio because I think that's just cool, in the form of true interactable sound items that people can place in the space around them and have conformed to the acoustics of the room, but that's just me. It's effectively, if you actually start participating in this, if you're interested in it, if you do a good job, and you land with a company that's actually trying to really revolutionize the space, you can, like, you can start contributing to this industry in a way that will be meaningful for ever, forever. Yes. So thanks for coming on this little journey with me today. Feel free to hit me up with questions. Um, and I didn't do that panel, but yeah, cool. Um, that's it. If you have questions, ask them. Otherwise, yeah, this is the audio room, so just sit here all day. <laughs> Motion parallax, this actually happens in visuals as well, where there's a change when, when something's moved, it sounds a little bit different. <laughs> Rudimentary, huh? Moving past things. Yeah. 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 I, I obviously did a lot of research into that one. <laughs> Any other questions that I will sound incredibly intelligent answering? Yes, hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess dynamic range I meant more uh, volume-wise. Uh, so do I think, I mean, at OSIC we recommend that developers use 48K 24-bit because like FMOD can output that. Um, and that's just so that you can get the highest fidelity possible um, because a lot of the HRTF cues, spectral cues, are in that higher, higher range. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a huge shift in the industry like on that particular point, you could email Audio Kinetic and ask them, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Sorry if that's not a good answer, but yeah, like that's not something that I specifically do a lot of work in at, at OSIC. We're more about like, hey, does this specialization thing sound good or not? 
Yeah. Any other weird questions? Weird or interesting questions? No? You can all go now. The doors are open, so. <laughs>